The eclipse is cool and all, but have you ever wondered what would happen if the moon was instead made out of glass? Well, I have a whole lot. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Would it create a death ray that would burn us all like ants? Or would something very surprising happen? You see, the answer was so unintuitive, I just had to make a video. I'm going to prove the answer by using both computer simulations and practical photography. And oh yeah, plenty of caustics. This one's gonna be a fun one, so stay tuned, grab a cool drink, and find some shade, because we're about to find out how hot it can really get. This is a simple magnifying glass, and I'm sure you're familiar with what happens when you focus sunlight into a spot. It gets really bright and therefore really hot. And that's because this is basically just a funnel for light. It's capturing all of the light passing through this circle and focusing it down to a point just hot enough to singe some wood and even start a fire if you really work at it. That took like five minutes. But if you want more heat, you just need to funnel more light by using a larger magnifying glass. Now this one is four times larger than the small one, meaning that it funnels four times the amount of sunlight. And if I focus the light down to the same size, that means this spot is getting blasted by four times the amount of light, and therefore four times the amount of heat. God, it's so bright, I can barely look at it. And if we scale our magnifying glass up even further, like the backyard scientist did, there's enough sun power getting funneled down to a focal point that even metal begins to melt. Completely melted. So what if we could scale that up even further? I mean, let's get crazy. Let's get nuts. What if we had a magnifying glass the size of the moon? The total sunlight hitting the moon is 13 petawatts of power. That is 13 million billion watts. That's a lot. Like over 4,000 times more power than the entire human race uses. Kind of a lot. <sighs> and if all of that light got concentrated down to the size of a city, it would indeed create a solar death ray. Focusing a moon-sized magnifying glass down to an area 10 miles wide would result in the instantaneous vaporization of literally everything in its path. The temperature on the ground would increase at a rate of 4,000 degrees Celsius every single second. In mere moments, the temperature down here would surpass the melting and boiling point of literally every material in the known universe, leaving behind a river of molten slag as it moves across the world. You see, this is what I imagine when I consider the moon being made out of glass. The eclipse would hit and we'd all just vaporize. But imagining is not good enough for me. I gotta know. So in order to find out, I decided to actually simulate the eclipse. So I've replicated the solar system within Cinema 4D here. And I've aligned the moon with the sun and the earth, which means if I turn on the moon here, I should get an eclipse. Look at that, okay. That looks just like the actual pictures of an eclipse from space. Pretty close, man. That's pretty close. But what would happen if I changed the material from rocky moon surface to glass? It... Okay, no, it's there. It was just, there's no bounce light in outer space. It's hard to see this stuff. What happens if I actually give it a bunch of craters? It's gonna make it appear more like frosted glass than a magnifying glass. Yeah, this isn't gonna work. It's like scratching your lens for billions of years. I'm just gonna go back to the regular glass. There we go. That's cool. Anyway, but what we're interested in is the eclipse. I'm gonna render out two images, both viewed of the Earth here, but one using the moon texture and the other one using the glass texture. So let's let that render. Um. They look identical. It's glass, it's see-through. Why is it casting a shadow that seems to be the exact same as the regular eclipse? I'm certain I did not make a mistake. I got my caustics turned on. We're definitely using the photon tracer. I got a lot of samples. This all should be working accurately. All right, you know what? I think I'm gonna try to double check this experiment by replicating it in real life. All right, I guess that means I need to buy something. While we wait for that package to arrive, I actually thought of a new question. What if the moon was actually square in space? Because you know, this video is sponsored by Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform for entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online. Whether you're just launching or your brand is already in orbit, Squarespace makes it easy to create a beautiful website all in one place. Their flexible website templates are perfect for any project. Showcase your art, start a blog, or launch a store with templates tailored to your needs. And the Fluid Engine reduces the need for orbital mechanics by letting you design every detail of your site with drag-and-drop technology that's out 
out of this world. And if you need some autopilot, there's the Blueprint AI, Squarespace's guided design system that's there to help you craft the perfect site. And if you wanna sell merch, Squarespace's custom merch feature is your mission command. You design your products and then they handle the production, the inventory, and the shipping. If you're ready to take your online presence to the moon, just click the link in the description to get a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, just go to squarespace.com slash corridor crew and you will save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Ah, whoa, did you hear that? Oh, I think our package is here. All right, you ready for this? Check this out. Oh boy, look what's arrived. This is a crystal ball made out of quartz and it's basically my new favorite thing. I mean, look at this. Spherical optics are pretty great. Is my eye big? Even though this thing is the size of a bowling ball, it weighs more than twice as much because I mean, it's literally a rock. I'm gonna take this downstairs to see if I can actually replicate the results I got on my computer. All right, so I have the glass sphere here to replicate the glass moon, but I've also 3D printed the moon here at the same size so that we can compare the two. And the sun will be replicated by this spotlight here, shooting a really intense blast of light over at this paper right here so that when I put the moon between the light source and the paper, it casts a shadow that I can then measure. But now for the million dollar question, is this gonna cast light or shadow? It looks exactly the same. <laughs> so in post, I can literally measure the luminance values of the shadow. The percentages are identical. So no wonder I couldn't tell a difference with my eyes. I feel like this basically proves that the real moon versus a hypothetical glass moon would have identical shadows. But why? Where is all the light going? When light hits a clear material, some physics happens, causing the light to bend. This is called refraction. And the amount of bending is called the index of refraction, or the refractive index. With no material or medium, such as the empty vacuum of space, the refractive index is simply one, meaning no refraction. As this number gets bigger, light gets bent more, such as with water with an index of 1.3. But glass actually bends light even more than that with an index of 1.5. Diamond, on the other hand, takes this significantly further with an index of 2.4. The refraction inside a diamond is so intense that it actually bends different color wavelengths more than others. This chromatic aberration is why diamonds appear so strikingly beautiful. Dang, they do be that pretty. Since the amount of bending is also related to the angle of the surface the light rays hit, something interesting happens when you begin to curve the surface outwards. Now the light gets bent in multiple different directions, causing the light to converge into a single focal point, just like what we saw with our magnifying glass. Photographers will understand this because camera lenses do the same thing. The distance from the glass to the focal point is called the focal length. A really short focal length creates really wide angle images, but a long focal length creates really zoomed in images. The only difference between these two shots is the curvature of the glass. So when your lens is a perfect sphere, where is the focal point? It's really easy to find out. As I bring this piece of paper closer to the ball, eventually the focal point will actually focus on the paper, but I'm still going. Ah, oh no, no, I'm getting closer and it's still not here yet. Eventually the light converges into a focal point right about here. Look at that, right off the edge of the surface. If the moon was made out of glass, it would still create a death ray, but just like right here next to the moon, certainly not near the earth. Remember, the moon is so far away from us that you can literally fit every planet in the solar system between the earth and the moon. Although if you're an astronaut approaching the moon, you should be careful, because if you go through this death ray, you will literally vaporize. It's so beautiful. <laughs> However, this does give us a clue as to why the glass moon casts a shadow. After light passes through the focal point, it continues on, completely missing the Earth, dispersing out into the universe. Because after all, what is a shadow if not a lack of light? Dang, it's, th it's literally throwing shade. Oh my god, yeah, it's... <laughs> dude, that's crazy. This is also why the view through a crystal ball is upside down. The light rays literally get flipped around. But that's not the whole story, because some of the light does make it through the glass to hit the Earth. Remember, refraction is a function of the angle at which it hits the surface. But if that angle is perfectly head-on, there's no refraction at all. And you can clearly see this with the laser whenever I hit dead center of the sphere. And you can also see a beam of light right in the center of the smoke right here, which is really cool. That means that during the glass eclipse, you would still see the sun. But what would that look like? 
This part's pretty cool. To understand, we just gotta look at cameras that use a glass ball as a lens. You might already be familiar with this type of camera because I use them all the time. They're called 360 cameras. Each lens of a 360 camera is essentially a glass sphere split in half. I know technically these aren't half spheres. I don't exactly know how the optics of this are working. Maybe there's an additional lens inside of it that I don't know about. If only you could break one open to see. Oh no! Oh, I think I understand now. It is a half dome inside of it. There's a cavity on the inside of the lens that is perfectly half spherical. I think I just learned a little bit about how 360 camera lenses work. All you gotta do is break them. These lenses are so wide angled that they can see stuff perfectly sideways from where they're aimed. The light actually refracts so far as to exit the sphere a full 90 degrees to the side. In this example, we are getting some crazy reflections on both the outside and the inside of the sphere, which is what's creating the cool pinwheel effect. So what effect would this have on the eclipse? Well, the glass moon is literally an extremely wide angle lens. It would see half of the entire sky, but then compress it down to the size of the moon as viewed from Earth. This means that the sun itself will appear to shrink until it becomes a point no bigger than any of the other stars in the sky. And the eclipse that it would create would be absolutely stunning. What all of this means is that my simulation was true. It's accurate. Both the real eclipse and the glass moon eclipse are virtually identical. And that's really cool. It's also kind of disappointing because I was really wanting to get like that solar death ray from the moon, but no. It's not possible. I mean, it would be possible if you moved the moon right next to the Earth, but then you would have many more problems than just a solar death ray. I mean, the gravity alone would end the Earth. Did a whole video about that. But I just wanted to see if a solar death ray was even possible. So I kept thinking. Imagine we get visited by an alien race so much more advanced than us, we couldn't possibly understand their technology. To them, we would seem like ants. So imagine they find amusement by, uh, burning us like the ants we are. Except they wouldn't need to use glass. There's a better option that I have yet to talk about. Air. You see, gas also refracts light, but only just like barely. For instance, hydrogen with an index of 1.00013 basically doesn't bend light at all until you start to compress it. The refractive index of a gas is directly related to its density. So as the pressure of a gas increases, so does its index of refraction. So on their way to Earth, the aliens gotta stop for gas. And the gas station is Jupiter because 90% of Jupiter is just straight up hydrogen, which of course they siphon away and store at atmospheric pressure inside an invisible force field. And although they only took a tiny share of Jupiter's hydrogen, like 0.01%, don't forget how freakishly huge Jupiter is. This invisible sphere would be 153,000 kilometers wide, making it 12 times larger than the Earth. That's big. However, down here, no one would even notice its arrival. It doesn't have enough mass for us to feel its gravity, and it wouldn't burn anything either. It actually has the exact opposite problem as our glass moon, which focuses way too close. The hydrogen lens, on the other hand, focuses way too far away. But this all changes when the aliens begin shrinking the size of the force field. And thanks to the ideal gas law, this action actually increases the pressure of the hydrogen. That means the refraction also increases, which begins pulling the focal point back towards the Earth, bringing it into focus. By shrinking the sphere, the aliens are literally just doing the equivalent of spinning the focus wheel on a camera lens. Once the sphere has shrunken down to about 29,000 kilometers across, the pressure would create the exact index of refraction needed to focus the sun's mighty power directly on us. And boy, would it get hot quick! Because the lens appears 67 times larger in the sky than our sun, it would produce 67 times more solar power. The temperature would immediately skyrocket to over 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. People would start to boil. That's hot. That is hot. The hot spot wouldn't be a small point either. It would be over 3,000 kilometers wide. Entire forests would ignite on fire. No, entire countries would. Everywhere within this concentrated light would experience civilization ending heat. What's more is that all of this light would normally be hitting the rest of the earth, meaning where it was once day is now almost nighttime and would actually be a lot colder, kind of like the inverse of a normal eclipse. Until the solar death ray visits. <laughs> 
love these types of thought experiments because they can lead to such great sci-fi stories. In sci-fi, we rarely get a good understanding of how much power mega weapons require or how they're even able to achieve them. It's like we're just supposed to believe that like, oh, I guess you just gotta like suck up the sun. Suck up the sun. This solar death ray, however, makes sense. Or at least it does to me. Does it make sense to you? Comments. I would love to see someone take this concept and run with it. And I would love to read about this from a talented author. Craig Allenson, perhaps? Or Dennis Taylor? Maybe even Brandon Sanderson? I just bet someone could weave a really interesting story using all of this. Could we Nailed it. I actually designed this magnifying glass, and if you want to print one yourself, links are down below. You'd be surprised how much you can learn by just like holding something in your hands. This is so cool. I've been doing this for all of like five minutes, and I feel like I've already discovered like so much about optics. Shout out to Scott Manley and Minute Physics for helping with a lot of the science in this video, and maybe check out what would happen if the universal logo was real. That was another fun thought experiment that of course destroys the world, classic. But here is my next idea. I'm going to try to do the liquid terminator effect practically. We'll see. So stay tuned and thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.